Hi guys, nice to see you. Hope everybody had a nice lunch. Um, I'm here to talk about testing front-end part of our web application. When we develop web application, it's not enough currently to just test our views and test that we reply proper HTML, give proper queries, and those queries return information to browser via HTTP protocol to consume. Often in web application, browser interaction part is itself very complex. And in those days, everybody is trying to build single page application where you don't have to reload page, you just move information back and forth, and you go to your Facebook page, you go to your Gmail page, and you expect everything to be smooth and working. And to test this thing, we have to automate browsers themselves. We have to command it. We have to do entire testing of it from one part to another, how it shows. Most popular tool to do it is Selenium. And in my talk, I will highlight how to work with it and show some best practices we use when working with testing web applications with Selenium tool. Installing Selenium is quite easy. You just do usual pip install Selenium. But the second part is a bit extra, is that Selenium automates real browsers. And it needs a bit of intermediary layer between a real browser and this library. It communicates with browser via HTTP and JSON protocol called WebDriver protocol. It is actually now a W3C specification, which is going to be adopted soon. It is currently a candidate release. And Mozilla and Google are working to implement it in their browsers. They have already actually implemented it. So web, web driver drivers, which you have to install, are released by Mozilla and Google themselves. They keep them in sync with their releases. Installing them is so you just go to website, download those drivers, and put them on a path in your system. And that's mostly it. There are a couple more steps. So you should know if you mention if you <laughs> find those on web pages. There is a tool for orchestration, those browsers called Selenium Server, which you don't need. And there is a tool called PhantomJS browser. We will get to it later, but mostly it's a headless mode for running browser, which renders page, but renders it only in memory. And you don't have to display application on a X server, graphic server. So imagine we have already installed Selenium tool. And just like fun, funny and easily we can interact with Python, we can interact with a browser. We import WebDriver from a library, and we initiate a web browser instance, like this one. This one. It even notifies us that this instance is being controlled remotely. Once we have it, we can issue comments to it. And it opens a page for us. Other than that, we can find an element on this page. In this browser, we give command find element by name. And as it is IPython, not just a real console shell, we can see things here, see methods we can use. Driver, cookies, file detector, lots of find element options for you to use. We have this element in a page DOM model. And we can use it. We can just send something to it. Auto completion, Rimini. And I could not <laughs> switch window fast enough. We are already here. Let's close it. Not the element, but the driver. OK. 
That was the easy part. In this part, we briefly showed that we can interact with browser, we can find elements in a web page, we can find them by their names, by their CSS classes, by a language for querying element in a tree called XPath, and by link text for a button or for a href. And so we can click all the things, and we can type all the things, and there are lots of methods to use, find element or find elements by something. They are actually relying on one internal method called find by, find by something, which is by ID, by XPath, by selector. And all the other utility methods just call to it. Usually in our internal method, we would be relying on this one, internal, find element or find elements. If you want to get this complex XPath selector, we can use Chrome DevTools, find some element here, for example, this image. This is the image in DOM tree, document object model tree. And for this image, we can copy XPath of this element. XPath for this Im image looks like this. That's the query. Any element ID is HP logo. And we can try to use it. And it will return us element to work with. Easy. All the tools we have. We have ability to query, we have ability to interact with page, and that's usually when tutorials stop and present you with future opportunity. Okay, go build things. It's easy like drawing an all. And let's try to draw an all on that. We will be drawing an all of an application which is a demo for Angular 2 framework. When you try to learn Angular 2, they give you a demo which you go through steps, and it gives you eventually an application called Tower of Heroes. It has a dashboard, there are some heroes, there is a list of heroes, and you can interact with those things. You can open one, you can change it, you can click Save, and it will wait a second and go back to dashboard. That's what we will try to test. I have written a little test case for this, and I will go through it. Here we just initiate a browser and ask it to go to this web page we are testing. Then, ugly thing called time sleep, because Angular applications, they take some time to load libraries, they take time to load assets, and if we try to interact with page just after we get there, we will get an error. It will not work, it will not test. It will, not, it will be a fails positive error. Test will fail. So we'll sleep a little. After that, we test a list of heroes. We find element by CSS selector module hero. That's here. When I was looking for it, I found this element, this div class model hero. And this model hero is, in CSS syntax, looks like this. So we find those elements, we look the list is of four elements, and that's the first test. Second test, we go the same place, we take first element in this list, This one. We click on it, we again sleep, wait for some interaction to happen, and we get to details page. Details page look like this. Details, we can click here, save, and something will happen. 
On this page, we find again another element. By CSS syntax, we find input. We send keys just like we did with Google. And we find element called button with text save. We click on it. We sleep again. And we get to our front page. We expect it to have text Dave. After that, in PyTest syntax, we called driver queued, which will close our browser. Let's test it. It opened browser. It opened this page, interacted, changed it, clicked, and we have Dave. Two tests passed. OK, great success. And now to the ugly part. Ugly pie was called so, so for a reason. Why it is ugly? First ugly thing here is those timeouts. Yes, just little application they take time to load, and we have to wait for a bit. But when we hard write those timeouts, like two seconds here, two seconds those, those two seconds are never proper time to wait. Sometimes web pages take longer time to load. There is network latency, there is Google Analytics in your page, there is like buttons. They sometimes load slow. And your page may take load, three seconds to load. And this test still should have passed. But we have two seconds. Sometimes your web page loads faster. It's like half a second, and in this case, two seconds is too slow. It takes, it takes too much time. We should have been just went on. Your test could have been faster if it wasn't for two seconds. To deal with it, uh, Selenium provides two things. First is implicitly wait for all elements to finish. So when it tries to find an element on a page, it waits for three seconds. It tries to find it for three seconds, tries, waits, tries, waits. And second part is a bit more complex. It waits only for some elements. First, it's easy to set up, but I would uh, recommend you not to use it because you don't want to wait for each element to load. Sometimes when your page is loading, it is OK. But when your page has already been loaded and you don't change anything, if you don't find an element you expected to find, it means something is broken. You should just show the state test has failed and go on. Implicit is not recommended. Recommended is just to explicitly wait for some things you want to wait. And second part, which is dry, which is ugly about this test, is it's too repetitive. It repeats itself with locators. It repeats itself with pages. It is not an easy experience to deal with. And writing tests must be easy, because when it is difficult to write tests, when it is difficult to understand what it does, nobody writes tests. And when nobody writes tests, application is broken by design, as they say. We should try to do better. We should try to design tests which would be easy to understand and easy to extend and easy to maintain. And there is a pattern called page object when we try to encapsulate a web page as a Python object. Python objects are great. We use them. We can extend them. We can inherit them. And we can hide a lot of logic and details in those objects and classes. And they will make our tests better. Let's take a look how we can use it. We have pages pi. And we initiate base page. We will hide driver instance in it. And we will hide waiting for this page to be loaded. This will be enough for a moment. And our first version will use only this base page, just a simple object, and a little extension of this base page called dashboard page, which will have here locator to not repeat itself several times, and which will have a property which returns heroes. After that, our test looks much nicer. We just initialize dashboard page, we open it, 
and we get length, and we get text of first element. Nice. Let's try to improve it. When we try to improve it, our second time, our second attempt would be to just repeat what we have done with an ugly test. Let's try to edit things. When editing things, we will go to another page, and okay, we will implement this other page also as a page object. In our pages, we will define class called edit page. We will define a method which will wait for it to be loaded. We will try to open it. And we will also hide some details about this page in a class. So we will not be dealing with explicit locator strings in our tests. In our test, we will just ask, give me header, give me name, like this. That's our dashboard page. It opened. It's mostly the same as it was. I just hide a hidden name and ID of first hero. We click it. We go to edit page. And we check it is loaded. Pretty self-explanatory. And we check that name is in a header. And then the second page. Second test. We load this page explicitly by its URL. Detail slash 12. We load this page explicitly. We open it. Then we clean everything from here. Type something new. Save button, we don't go into locator string. We just type save button, click. And after that, we expect dashboard page to be loaded and first text to be Dave. Let's try it. Something went wrong. Let's try it again and take a look at what happens in the browser. First test passed. OK, second, pa second test, we had Dave. We went back to home, and it's still Narco. Strange. Let's try it here. We go here, Tour of Heroes, Details, click Save, and nothing happens. Why? I guess we just found a bug in Google tutorial for Angular 2. It worked when we were using ugly test, when we went dashboard to the item, change, save, and it changed. But if we went directly to URL, it did not work. That's a nice test. It exposed bug, and it also shows that you should not combine several things into one test. When we combined go to dashboard, click, go back, it worked. When we tried going directly to edit page, it did not. It's a nice test. We will not be going into fixing their page right now. We will go into details. That's one of the things which you should do and you shouldn't do is you should test small things by as small tests as possible. One test for one condition. Testing those small things can get slow because browsers are slow and JavaScript is fast to execute but slow to load. And what I wanted to say, it's okay to cut corners here. Like if you are testing a web application that is an online store or some admin panel which needs login functionality and it would take a few seconds each time each of your tests login user, you should cut corner here. You should not make your users login. You should not make your tests login, login each time you run something. You should. There are ways to do it. You can just create some quick login URL. Just don't expose it in production. Like you go to some URL and you are automatically logged as a user ID something. Or you can log in once and save cookies and instead of really logging in into your application, you just substitute cookies header into your browser and test other things. It's okay to cut corners. 
a bit controversial advice here, but totally logical. You don't always need Selenium to test web application. You can use requests, you can use regular tests for Django and Flask to test what your API returns. Is JSON right or not? On what to use, XPath or CSS, sometimes CSS does not cut it, but bonus for CSS is that everybody knows it. Uh, all the web developers know how to compose those queries and make them simpler, so usually use CSS. XPath only when it is not enough. There are tools for when you build this framework of a page object, you can also implement into it tools called Needle. Selenium has a feature to save a page or save a part of the page, and, but it's still low level. You don't want to use it. You should use it in your page object class. And in this page object class, other people have already done it, and you just plug in those functionality in page object class you are building, and you can compare screenshots of a page before and after some change. And you can see that your web design has not been broken. It still looks the same if it was supposed to look the same. If it was changed, then you will need to regenerate baseline images, those images you are comparing to. Some people say that frameworks are just a collection of other people's hacks. And of course, there are frameworks around. My favorite one is Bokchoy. It's a pun because there was a framework named after some cabbage in Ruby language, and they were developing a framework for acceptance testing in Python, and they named it Bokchoy. It is nose-based framework, which extends Selenium and implements Needle and implements some other nice helpers tool, helper tools. I used it and I liked it, but there are other notable uh, Piasonte, a bit unmaintained, and a new one called Webium from Wargaming Company. And that's mostly it. Thank you. I am now welcoming your questions. Okay, we've got time for some questions. We have a microphone. Please raise your hand if you have one. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, when do you choose to use Selenium, and when do you choose to do the requests tests? If we are working with browser things, if there are uh, mechanics which happen in a browser JavaScript, you have to use Selenium. If there is only check for some element is present in an HTML of a page, some element is present in JSON response of your web server, it is easy to check with requests, and requests are 100 times faster than Selenium. Those things should not be sent to a browser. It will save your life. Uh, hello, thank you for your talk. So uh, I once used Selenium to actually test a very big web application, and a problem I had there was that uh, when I, I obviously used wait for element, right, and then um, it found this element, and the problem is that apparently wait for element is not an atomic operation, which means that if another thing on the side changes, in the meantime, it would like put the virtual uh, the virtual cursor at the location, which would then be invalid, and it would click like an image that loaded in the meantime. So obviously, I can't really wait for all the elements to load because there might be JavaScript that constantly loads things. So what do you do in such a situation where the, your site layout might change, uh, and you don't like it's not not deterministic that it changes, and you can't really wait for everything to stop getting data? What do you do in such a situation? Uh, I have showed in my tests exactly this <laughs> question I had when Angular views are loading they load some elements and then some, they build a structure in those elements inside. Maybe they don't load all other things, all images, all styles, we don't wait for them. Key is to understand which 
element has to load in your document object model. Like on our first page, if there is a list of heroes present, we can assume that the page has loaded. If on the second page there is an input on this page, we can assume this page has loaded and we can start interact with them. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I also have a question about, uh, two questions actually, about Selenium. I'm abusing it to run Nagios checks. So I'm running, constantly running, like every five minutes, running login checks and web applications. And what I've, the problems I've had are, um, one, the uh, process, so like Chrome, the driver, doesn't die. So when I quit or close the Selenium, I can see dead processes um, I'm not sure if I'm doing something wrong or um, why this, the web driver process isn't dying on, on, on machines. That's just a feature of Selenium driver. It does not close driver. It doesn't close your browser automatically. You have to call quit explicitly if you want it to close. Yeah. And also I can recommend if you are Want to, if you want to run this thing continuously on your server, you should try either running a phantom JS, like here. Um, when we were just initializing driver web driver Chrome, you can initialize web driver phantom JS, or you can initialize Chrome with some options, and it will run run in headless mode. It will n still pop-up application, but it will not require graphic server. You can run it on EC2 instance, Elastic Computing, Amazon instance. You can run it on a Linux server without display at all. It will consume much less memory, and you can have it running constantly. Okay. Yeah, that's, it sounds good. The other problem was then that it was filling up my temp. So w w when the browser died, it was leaving artifacts in the temp, so I could see the memory usage and the machine rising and also disk usage. So it was leaving behind in the temp directory quite a large um, Chrome footprint. So what I was doing, with, I was just cronning, uh, deleting the processes and the... the um well, that's strange, and, but I guess then you have to write your launcher script which would clean up after that and kill instance if it does not die. Maybe you have outdated Selenium driver with some issues, or maybe you have outdated browser. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the talk, hi. Um, I wanted to ask two questions, if I can. Um, the first one, about uh, uh, you had an error in Angular, which prevented you, uh, like, which uh, raised the failure. Uh, I'm assuming that's a JavaScript error of sorts. Is there a way you could return that trace back, for instance, for that uh, JavaScript failure from the dev console of Chrome or maybe from the headless driver? And the second question I have is, which versions of Chrome does the web driver support? And basically, who maintains it? Is it, is it something from Selenium that they maintain, or is it external? Can you write your own drivers? And thank you. Um. Selenium does, Selenium does not give JavaScript traceback unless you set, set up something in your page which would. But short answer is no. Selenium does not give you traceback. Selenium just indicates the problem. But by the way, when you mention it, when you build those page object classes, you could create exceptions for you to use. Selenium exceptions are, I haven't found something. I could not locate an element. But you, when you expect those things to happen in your page objects, like locate a search box or try to type something there, you can raise your own exceptions and they might be more convenient for you and make the debugging a bit easier. And also, when Selenium meets a page which is uh, not some element missing, but 
full-blown Django exception, yellow page, database could not connect or something like this. You could also detect the situation and raise more meaningful exception. Not some element was not found. Of course, there was not element found on that yellow page, but raise a Django raise textual exception from your use case. <clears throat> and for a second question, sorry. Yeah, who maintains it? Selenium is maintained by open source company, Source Labs and Selenium. And those things, Selenium interacts with browser using web driver protocol, which is open, which is W3C standard, JSON over HTTP. And those little things which take requests from Selenium and translate them into browser actions called web driver drivers. And the best part is that they are maintained by browser vendors. Google themselves create a driver for Google Chrome, and Mozilla themselves create a driver for Firefox. We don't have more time for questions. You can, of course, ask Tim afterwards. Just remember that from the app, you can vote, you can rate this question. You can also uh, add comments, add some feedback that can be useful for Tim for future talks. So please uh, and clap your hands again for Tim.